First off, one of the best opening lines of any novel I've ever read. Justice, you get justice in the next world. In this one, you have the law. I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. At times I worry that I come across as too wooden in these reviews because I am always aware of the persona that I am trying to affect. Namely because any footage that I use is probably about the third time that I've tried to say something. I can't ever not feel like I'm watching a performance. That's kind of the same way that I feel about William Gaddis novels. I recently read A Frolic of His Own, uh, the final novel published in his lifetime, the National Book Award winner of 1994. And this book in particular um, really feels like I'm watching actors on a stage play the characters on a page. You know, I constantly feel like I'm at the right hand of the archon of plot, and we are gazing down on these characters and watching their every move. You know, I see these characters as people, though we all have our different definition of what that word means, but I also really see them as uh, chess pieces of the plot, as vessels of various parodies and satiric gags. I even hear them as these proto-Sorkin characters. It's, it's stylized in this very abundant way, and yet it seems very vernacular, uh, as well as being encyclopedic and very nuanced in its understanding of uh, facts and systems of the world. But where Sorkin's characters are often too well understood or maybe overly understood, Gaddises are just the opposite. Characters are constantly talking over each other and misunderstanding each other. This is all a roundabout way of saying that, look, I'm aware of the artifice that these characters are. As a reader, I want to be as close to my characters as possible, but structurally speaking, in this book, that distance that I feel with the artifice of the characters gives me an analog for the distance that the characters feel uh, sort of between themselves and between their exterior world. A lot of things are abstracted out of reality for characters in this novel. That's the paradox of a Gaddis character. They've got all these words, they are all these words, and yet that brings them no closer to understanding each other. The abundance of language doesn't render the universe any clearer. Our main character in A Frolic of His Own is a guy named Oscar Kreese, who is this fail son of a federal judge. Uh, he's a part-time history teacher specializing in the Civil War, and in 1979, he wrote a play called Once at Antietam. This book takes place in 1990. The title Once at Antietam is meant to invoke a line from Shakespeare's Othello. It invokes, but in fact transposes it. The line from Othello is that at Aleppo once, and so instead of once at Aleppo, once at Antietam. You get it. And a thing that once at Antietam and this line or this speech in Othello both have in common is suicide. Because in Othello, this speech uh, is coming at the end of the play and is going to be right before Othello kills himself. Spoiler alert, if you have not read or seen Othello, it's been 400 years, what are you doing? As for Once at Antietam, the central conceit of this play uh, relies on this sort of a family history of Oscars, wherein his grandfather, who himself was a Supreme Court judge um, and served on Oliver Wendell Holmes's Supreme Court, had to hire a substitute or a replacement soldier on both sides of the Civil War. So he lived in the South, but then he had business interests up North, and so he was caught on both sides and ended up having to send a replacement. The story goes that uh, or at least this is how it happens in the play, those two replacements meet on the battlefield of Antietam and kill each other, and thus, you know, kind of create this legalistic, symbolic suicide. Oscar files a lawsuit against the filmmaker of this Civil War blockbuster called The Blood in the Red, White, and Blue, uh, and this blockbuster shares a lot of similarities, including the substitute suicide uh, kind of conceit, 
uh, with his play. And this is the principal driver of the plot. Now, all of this is not to mention all of the other lawsuits that are in this book. In particular, there's this one about an art installation in which a dog has gotten itself trapped. And so the artist is suing the town to stop them from dismantling his sculpture because he says, you know, it's like a dismantlement of my art or whatever. And in the meantime, uh, the dog gets struck by lightning. You know, I read at some point that Gaddis was toying with the idea of making this entire novel uh, out of just like depositions and law cases. And there are plenty of those in it, but you do have the kind of traditional, so to speak, uh, unattributed Gaddis dialogue and the rolling uh, long sentence uh, narration that uh, takes an indeterminate amount of time before you swing back into the conversations of the characters. This book is lousy with lawsuits, and most of the lawsuits end up being pretty lousy themselves. The characters in this book are trapped by the morass of legalese, and their only means of making sense out of this world is by using the blunt instrument of the lawsuit. Because in the first two books, the recognitions in JR, uh, both Wyatt and Bast uh, make these kind of Faustian deals. And in the latter two, McCandless and Oscar are both, you know, effectively middle-aged to old men that uh, have seen the moment of their greatness flicker. They have seen their art get ignored and or ridiculed. One could presume that they either had the good sense to turn down the Faustian deal or uh, that they were too arrogant about their art, which is pretentious to middling at best, um, that they were uh, too convinced by the purity of their art um, and that that would guarantee their success. In this book, Oscar, who is in his 60s, comes upon his own Faustian bargain by way of this lawsuit. And despite an arrogance that ought to undermine him from the start, he actually gets lucky in no small part due to an assist from his federal judge of a father. And as soon as he starts winning, that's when I started to actively dislike Oscar. You know, in a way that I was supposed to. Because moments of narrative grace, I think, are really useful ways of revealing the true nature of your character. Another way to reveal your character's true nature is to, and this is something else that Gaddis does quite a bit, uh, subject your characters to uh, unholy amounts of sadism. <laughs> I don't think Oscar's a monster. Certainly he's not any more of a monster than the system in which he's operating. I just think that he sees this moment of narrative grace as a moment of justice, as a moment of vindication. But Gaddis characters rarely, if ever, rise above the I don't know, bare minimum of expectations of their circumstances, which is not an altogether incorrect diagnosis of large chunks of this world. There is always the messy room. Always these Gadisian protagonists live among such clutter, which permanent mood, but where, say, in J.R., it's Bast that's getting buried alive in J.R.'s mail, Oscar's study is all his own clutter. He is situated much more closely to the reality and the circumstances that he has made for himself. So the clutter becomes this reinforcing agent. It reminds Oscar of all the disorder in his room and in the universe and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can think of it as, uh, I suppose, maybe a younger Oscar or any younger Gadisian artistic protagonist would have tried to use their art to create order or a sense of justice in the world. Uh, but Oscar is a step removed from that, right? He's using a lawsuit over a piece of art that he is kind of needlessly clinging on to from his past. Um, he's using that lawsuit to bring order in a sense of justice. All the characters in this novel are, they are trying to use lawsuits to uh, bring a sense of satisfaction and of wholeness uh, and a sense of justice. Thank you. 
This is a kind of a nice read uh, in these litigious times because so much of the actual like policy decisions uh, get hashed out at the Supreme Court level. Um, they get made or they don't get made at the Supreme Court level. And we're about to have, you know, I assume some magnitude of change to Roe v. Wade. And within both the Supreme Court and like the law generally, there is this uh, kind of myth of impartiality in this notion of precedent um, that is particularly espoused by the side that is about to make this uh, very partisan decision that uh, very expressly ignores a certain kind of precedent. Reading a contemporary Supreme Court brief, you know, look at anything that Antonin Scalia wrote, particularly King v. Burwell, uh, Jiggery Pokery, Pure Applesauce. My law fans know what I'm talking about. Reading any of that kind of contemporary stuff uh, is very reminiscent of some of the absurd stuff that happens in this book. For instance, uh, the whole diatribe that Judge Crease goes on about what exactly constitutes an act of God and sort of the absurdities that he uses in order to arrive at an obviously predetermined decision bears a striking resemblance to the language that is used. It's enough to make you think to yourself, this is all just overeducated Ivy League nerd shit posting. It's not a rigorous school of legal thought, it's just an erudite and esoteric way of reverse engineering things according to your partisanship or ideology. Why do I bring all this up? Because as the first line of this book tells us, the law is not co-equal with justice. It is in fact a substitute for it. It's an inferior substitute for it. But for the characters in this novel, uh, the law is something that is literally idolized. It is um, almost assumed to be this higher power that transcends human frailty and fallibility. But it is, in fact, this imperfect and constantly redefined thing depending on who is doing the defining. Here's another good illustration. Um, the suicide, right, in which the two replacements that kill each other at the Battle of Antietam in Oscar's play and family history. That suicide is very symbolic, but it follows a very sort of legalistic, logical framework. You know, man A is equal to replacement B and equal to replacement C. Replacement B and C kill each other, therefore, uh, suicide has happened, right? It kind of follows a weird veneer of logic, but it's not actually true. That symbolic suicide is abstracted from reality in the same way that justice is abstracted from the law. And I think that abstraction is what this book uh, really excels at thematically. It was a bit of a slog. <laughs> It was. I gave it like uh, three and a half stars, I would say, is my true rating of it. Um, no more of a slog than any other Gaddis book. Thank you for watching. Um, I am probably maybe not going to do any videos in January. We'll see. Who knows? It depends on how I feel. Uh, whenever I do come back, though, I promise I won't do any more William Gaddis or Don DeLillo books. Until then, uh, hopefully I have an outro planned, maybe?